Hi, right, can you hear me? Can I be heard? Hello? This is Howard Pollack. Can anybody hear me? Hello. Hi, Howard. I can hear you fine. This is Kathy with El Dorado County. Thank you very much for responding. <laughs> You're quite welcome. Checking the technology. There you go. Yeah. So I see we have 24 people on the call, which is great. We'll start at around 10 o'clock, give people a chance to log in. Record. So I can see that the recording has started and there's your first slide. Right. And then the issue for me is uh, accessing the uh, manage the participants, admit all. Can you see my participant list on the screen? No, I cannot. Okay, well, that's so good. it's if you found some way to admit all, I think that was the magic yeah, touch. Yeah. Right. Perfect. But so now, um, as a as a viewer, I just I have my participant list on the right because I chose to list it that way, and your um, your carries in California slide is up front and perfect. Okay. All right, so I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning uh, or this afternoon, wherever you are. And um, my name is Howard Pollack. I think you know me by now. Some people may be new. And so um, I uh, have been running this course for the last seven years or so, uh, taking over from Steve Silverstein. And then before him, I think it was Jane Weintraub. And uh, we will continue this uh, series in the fall. To, uh, traditionally, we have not held this series in the summer. So, um, and then um, there may be a new person who is leading this uh, series at that time. And uh, so I just wanted to say thank you for all the uh, times that uh, you've all participated in this. Um, I want to thank Dorian Hollis for putting uh, all the information together on the website. Uh, you'll see that there are three documents, actually four documents on the website that you can download uh, or view, and um, including today's slides in a PDF format. And I am going to be uh, sharing my uh, screens on uh, PowerPoint 
And so you'll see individual clicks that uh, you won't see in the PowerPoint. Um, just some logistical issues there. So I felt like uh, this might be kind of a swan song for me, and I thought I would share with you my experiences and what I have found out about tooth decay or dental caries in California. Uh, and uh, because um, 27 years ago, I embarked on a, uh, a needs assessment, oral health needs assessment of children, and I really haven't shared that information with you all. And so part of what I'm going to do today includes that. So um, I've uh, advanced to the second slide. And for some folks on the line, they may not be familiar with, with uh, all the details about tooth decay. So I thought I would share um, some of, of what tooth decay is, what dental caries is, the, the disease that we call caries. Um, I always tell my students there is no such word as carry. It's like diabetes, there's no diabetes. Uh, it's not a plural noun, it just happens to be a noun with an S on the end of it. Um, with regard to uh, tooth decay, it occurs in primary teeth and it occurs in permanent teeth. And you see a picture there of uh, some decay in primary dentition or deciduous dentition. Here are the molars on the upper arch and the central incisors have some decay on the mesial and incisal surfaces. And again, on the molars on the other side. Uh, let me just make sure I'm in the right place. So tooth decay happens on coronal surfaces on the crowns of teeth from the pits and fissures that you can see uh, the black stains here, uh, which are probably much more advanced than what you see in the surface of the tooth. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, tooth decay could start on a pit and fissure surface, uh, but could uh, uh, advance to uh, include the pulp of the tooth. This is a root canal uh, treatment here about to begin. Uh, with a rubber dam clamp and um, a white rubber dam and the tooth decay has been removed and exposed to pulp underneath it. Uh, this is the enamel, the dentine beneath that and then the pulp beneath that. Tooth decay occurs on the aproximal surfaces between the teeth, particularly on the molars. And so you'll see here that uh, um, there's uh, a slide that uh, is showing the molar here with a, an occlusal amalgam filling. But of interest, particularly this is one of my patients, I took the photograph not because of the amalgam buildup following a root canal treatment on the tooth in front of it, but because of this white lesion with a little brown stain in the center of it. That represents the tooth decay that started between the teeth that we would not all otherwise see uh, because the tooth in front of it would hide it. So this is a common site for tooth decay and the decay is probably much more advanced than this white stain on the surface of the tooth, uh, which is a really demineralization, loss of minerals in that tooth. And even though there's no cavitation at this point, there's no hole, uh, the decay is probably much more advanced beneath the surface into the dentine of the tooth. Tooth decay also occurs on the root surface of the tooth. And uh, you can see here uh, the root surface of that cuspid tooth. And um, uh, also you see a couple of crowns on the teeth behind. Tooth decay may or may not cause pain. Doesn't always. Uh, we see a lot of patients who have advanced tooth decay and they say, I've never had any pain. So that um, doesn't always occur. Certainly it's an infection within the tooth. But the infection may go beyond the tooth and uh, uh, 
cause abscess formation. And then we deal with the restoration and the cost of restoration of the teeth. Uh, the root canal treatments that may be uh, necessary, which are more expensive. Teeth could be extracted. And this is a, an extracted tooth with an extensive uh, carious lesion on the root surface of the tooth. And then we deal with replacement of teeth um, that is much more expensive with partial dentures, uh, fixed bridge work, uh, implants and crowns and the rest. So I just wanted to, to share all of that with you so that um, you're aware of the complexity of what tooth decay is, the serious infection and the infection may go systemically and we know that individuals have um, died as a consequence of untreated tooth decay. So we go to the next slide and uh, sometimes tooth decay is obvious. Uh, obvious discoloration you see in the deciduous or primary teeth here. Um, and so it doesn't take an expert eye to, to see that. Um, in terms of uh, surveys that we do of caries, uh, we really don't have to have a dentist examine children to be able to say, uh, yeah, there's caries in these teeth, even though it may not go to the extent of cavitation that we see on the other side. And uh, obviously, uh, these teeth may be causing pain, may not be causing pain, um, but these Cavities have been like this for a long time. Parents may not be aware of it. Child may not have complained of pain. Um, and uh, with the lips closed, and if the parent's not brushing the teeth for the child, then they may not be aware of this until all of a sudden in the middle of the night, there's pain and abscess. And uh, maybe a visit to the emergency room is, is indicated. Um, so I'm just playing around with the uh, participants here, submitting people as they join. Uh, it's much more extensive into the dentine of the tooth. And if you look at the slide on the left, uh, these pictures of teeth on the top, ICDAS is an international um, uh, diagnosis, uh, assessment of uh, the pits and fissures of teeth, as well as other surfaces. And so from the left, you see no decay, uh, decay starting between the teeth here, uh, more extensive decay as we move to the right, I see dash three and four, and uh, then starting of cavitation and extensive lesions. And you can see that the x-ray appearance of these particular teeth, uh, the, this is normal, uh, this is a bite block between the, um, the teeth when taking the x-ray, although there may be caries on this upper tooth here on the mesial surface. Uh, the dark area in the middle of the tooth is the pulp. Decay beginning in the interproximal or aproximal surface, moving into the dentine below the enamel. And then as we move to IC-3 and 4, you can see the very large extensive decay underneath the tooth that is just not apparent when looking uh, eyeballing of the tooth and much more extensive here as we see the start of cavitation. So when we see decay on the surface of the teeth, it's much often much more extensive than we than it appears on the surface. Um, and then the crown is, is sorry, I just want to go back to that slide. The crown is very obvious. This is a, this, uh, a stainless steel crown that often is the uh, choice preferred choice of, of dentists and pediatric dentists in, in restoring uh, deciduous molars and uh, other teeth. So um, like I say, uh, yes, anybody can probably look at these teeth and say uh, there's a filling or a crown, uh, there is some decay, but uh, the initial stages, it may be less obvious and uh, a more experienced eye may be indicated. 
So we'll go to the next slide, and this is showing tooth color fillings and sealants. And here you see on the left, the top left, the stain in the tooth. And the dentist went in and drilled to uh, find the extent of the decay. And the dark brown area in the dentine indicates uh, what is probably a rested caries or decay that's not soft anymore and can be left underneath the restoration that will seal this uh, and prevent further sugars uh, entering in this to feed the bacteria and they, the bacteria that remain will probably die. Uh, we don't do bacterial sampling of teeth um, because it's such a frequent procedure and expensive procedure to do. Um, it's a frequent procedure to do the restorations expensive procedure to do bacterial sampling. So we don't do bacterial sampling. And then a restoration in a tooth colored material and uh, uh, not even an expert eye of a dentist may even detect this as a filling on the top right there. Uh, on the bottom, you see uh, a fissure system in this molar here and maybe a, a little brown stain in the center of the tooth. And the dentist or um, person who was going to provide a sealant to this tooth decided that a sealant would be a preferable way of dealing with this rather than drilling into the tooth. A sealant can be placed without a local anesthetic. And here you see what a sealant looks like. The white sealant shows up so that when we re-examine a child, we can see if the sealant is there or not. Uh, it's not anesthetic at the back of the mouth to have that white area, but that may be confused with the white area of demineralized enamel. So again, this may require a trained eye to detect if this is a sealant. Typically, we don't think of a sealant as a restoration, but as a preventive treatment, and we don't include it in the traditional count of tooth decay. Whereas a filling we do include as uh, a treated form of tooth decay. So when we look at untreated and treated tooth decay, in various surveys, uh, we use terms that are not interchangeable, but are confused oftentimes. So I wanted to explain that. So in terms of what decay or caries prevalence is, it's recorded at one point or one period of time. You may examine a, um, a population over several months, let's say, or even a year or even several years. We're using a sample of the population, so hopefully that sample is representative of the entire population. Oftentimes it is not, and that uh, produces bias in our estimate of the population level of caries. We're looking at the percent of individuals with any evidence of tooth decay when we're talking about prevalence. It could be one cavity, one small filling, or it could be many cavities or many fillings. No matter how many teeth or surfaces are affected or how badly, it could be one tooth with a need for root canal or extraction. But in terms of caries prevalence, it counts. So we may often be looking at untreated caries because in uh, surveys of treatment needs, uh, that's really all we're looking for is, is how much treatment needs to be delivered to uh, obviously with a, a particular patient, with this particular patient, but also with a population group, how much treatment is needed by this population group. Or, and we may be looking at treated tooth decay uh, as I've shown previously. In terms of severity, uh, again, we're looking at one point or period of time, again, with a sample of the population. Here, we're looking at the average number of teeth or tooth surfaces affected by tooth decay per individual. So obviously, it's for the, a group, and we average out what the uh, number of teeth is that's affected. It's either untreated decay or treated. And in terms of treatment, it could be filled or extracted teeth. Uh, and uh, with primary teeth, we use the lower uh, case letters, D, F, S, to represent decayed or filled primary teeth surfaces. In a very young population under the age of, let's say, five, 
we may be looking at uh, missing teeth, missing due to caries, particularly molars, whereas the uh, anterior teeth may be naturally exfoliated at a uh, young age. And with permanent teeth, we use the uppercase letters BMFS or BMFT to represent the decayed or missing, missing due to caries or extraction due to caries, rather than missing due to um, some other reason, uh, trauma, for instance, or periodontal disease in older populations. When we're talking about uh, surveys, uh, there's a difference between assessment and diagnosis. So with assessment, we use our eyes and hopefully people are using corrective lenses. There was a study done in Australia many years ago um, to look at people attending the Australian uh, Annual Dental Association meeting and uh, there was an optometrist or ophthalmologist set up to provide a screening. And it turned out that one third of the dentists needed corrective lenses that they didn't have. Are, you, are we using a mouth mirror or, or not? That might make a difference. Uh, are we using an explorer or not? That might make a difference. Typically now, we try not to use uh, very sharp explorers that might actually cause cavitation in an uncavitated carrier situation. Are we using the available light or a flashlight or there may be a portable uh, stand with a light on it? Um, we don't use x-rays in assessments and surveys. And we tend therefore to underestimate uh, the degree of caries, whether it's talking about prevalence or severity. Oftentimes it's difficult to assess if a tooth has been extracted due to caries. Um, and so again, that may take a trained eye. Um, sorry, just going around and showing participants and admitting uh, Rosanna Jackson there. The diagnosis um, again, we need uh, corrective lenses for our eyes. Uh, oftentimes, uh, nowadays, uh, people will have loops and magnifying lenses that really uh, make us very aware of all the small changes. We will use a mouth mirror. We will use an explorer, although again, we shouldn't be pushing hard on an uncavitated uh, lesion. Uh, we'll use a dental light uh, and, uh, uh, or headlight. And x-rays that can identify the proximal caries between the teeth, the depth of that caries, whether root canal treatment has been previously provided or whether uh, it may be needed or even uh, a need for extraction that we may not be able to tell uh, from the assessment. So oftentimes an assessment, as I said, is an underestimate. And when patients or individuals who've been part of the survey then go to their dentist, the dentist may say, well, I see many more cavities than you thought you had, or they're deeper, or uh, there may be a difference, and that's one of the reasons. So, caries in its early and late stages. In the early stages, probably in the enamel uh, only, there may be poor agreement or reliability within the same individual looking at the same situation on different occasions or between different examiners. So uh, one of the questions that I want to pose in our discussion later is, uh, what is a cavity? What is caries? Uh, does it have to be substantiated by a second person? Some surveys ignore early signs of caries because it's difficult to get agreement and so uh, only rely upon the late stages of decay. And the, the uh, the examiners are told, when in doubt, use the lesser category so that if they're not sure if it's caries, there's no caries. Um, when I did the survey uh, 20 odd years ago, we had a category for if you're in doubt on an 
occlusal surface of the molar, whether those caries or not, indicate there's a sealant needed. In the late stages, uh, it's dentine caries, whether you put a knee on the end of dentine or not. There's usually good agreement and reliability within the same individual or between different examiners. And to do a survey appropriately, there has to be a measure of reliability between the examiners or within the same examiner to be sure that the, the assessment is uh, correct. I'll be talking about that um, shortly. So in terms of differences in survey data, is it a real difference or a true difference? Yes, if there's high agreement and reliability between the examiners. Any difference may be due to age differences in the same population over time. Uh, measuring the impact of an intervention, is this a survey in order to just assess treatment needs, or are we trying to assess whether or not a certain risk factor, let's say the frequency of eating sugar, or a preventive factor, let's say living in a fluoridated area, is this gonna make a difference? And is there a true control group to measure this against, uh, particularly if it's a, a survey that's done before and after in the intervening time period? So any changes uh, that there may be over time uh, have to be thought of in terms of risk factors and preventive factors. For instance, uh, um, dental sealants weren't always part of the California Medicaid program or Dentical program. And uh, so any changes may be due to change in policy uh, rather than a change in um, tooth decay. So maybe it's not a real or it's an untrue uh, difference because there's poor agreement. So is the difference not real, but just a difference in uh, the reliability between the examiners? And is it due to uh, selecting different samples that are not representative of the population? For instance, when we uh, organized our school-based survey, um, we quickly found out that some uh, schools are not well integrated, um, either economically, by socioeconomic status, or by race or ethnicity. Some schools are 100% uh, uh, more um, ethnically diverse and some are not diverse at all. Um, so you have to be uh, thinking in terms of, is this a representative sample? Or we're not using the appropriate statistical analysis and, uh, and we need to, um, we need to have obviously a statistician, not only at the end when we've collected the data, but to help us in uh, setting up the, the survey so that we're, as, uh, we're not biased. So researchers must, and we use this expression, bend over backwards to reduce the possibility that the results are due to improper methods. Rather than just going in, having somebody take a look at the teeth and say, uh, we have 10% of the children who have tooth decay here. Um, is that a real assessment of the total population or is it just that one dentist or hygienist, whoever in that particular school? So how do we reduce discrepancies in data? Uh, calibration. Uh, we have to have a, a, a training session one person is designated as the gold standard who says uh, this is decay, this is not decay, and we use that person to uh, judge uh, the other dentist by or the other hygienist by. Um, there has to be independent assessments of the same individual without knowledge of the previous assessment so that you then compare those uh, assessments of the same subject, discuss any differences, and sometimes we have to let go individuals who are too strict or too lenient in their application of the uh, standards 
and the um, the uh, the methods. Should we use dentists or hygienists or dental assistants or others for these surveys? Well, certainly dentists may be more familiar with caries, fillings, and sealants, but some surveys have shown with proper training uh, and proper calibration that there uh, may not be that much of a difference. Uh, it may depend upon the budget. Uh, if you've got a lot of money, then uh, maybe you can pay the dentist more. Uh, are they volunteers or are they paid? The recorders have to be accurate as well. So we want to make sure that when I say a certain tooth was decayed on a certain surface, I want to be sure that the recorder uh, records that accurately, either on a paper document or on, um, or on uh, a computer of some kind. So again, we must bend over backwards to reduce the possibility that the results are due to improper methods. So on the website uh, that's, um, for, our, for this series, um, there are some documents. One is uh, the Cognac uh, training manual that I put together in 1993. Then the full uh, report of the oral health needs assessment of children, California. And then a document that I found in the library uh, at UCSF that uh, shows how to do a survey uh, that was put together in 1955, which I think is a very uh, worthwhile uh, document to take a look at and for you to have. So this is the cover sheet of uh, one of the earlier surveys that I was able to find from 1936. It's a dental survey of San Francisco elementary school children. Some 46,000 children were screened, nearly an entire census of the uh, uh, children aged six to 14. This was done as part of the WPA at the time, the Works Progress Administration, both by the Department of Public Health and the local dental society. And um, what they found was uh, uh, at age 11, uh, the mean number of untreated carious permanent teeth, uh, on average, almost two teeth per child, uh, and then three teeth per child at age 14. Remembering that the 12 year permanent molars, second molars come through at age 12, and then uh, many of them will decay in the first two years. What they also found that uh, more than 40% of eight-year-olds had focal involvement or needed an extraction of a deciduous or a permanent tooth. By age 14, one in seven 14-year-olds had focal involvement or extraction as we indicated, remembering that for eight-year-olds, you've got the, uh, the mixed dentition of primary and permanent teeth, and by 14, all of the primary teeth have been exfoliated, naturally lost. The tooth fairy. There was particularly interest in 1936 about six year molars. That's the first permanent molar that comes in behind all the baby teeth. And uh, they found that 30% of six year molars were carious uh, for the age groups eight to 14. And an estimated additional 20% had already been treated. They didn't look at treated tooth decay in this survey. They just estimated it. In terms of deciduous teeth by age eight, uh, in addition to the need for extraction of pulpal treatment, untreated caries peaks at about 23%, or so one in uh, four or five uh, children uh, needing some kind of treatment. Another survey in Oakland, 1951, uh, looked at over 14,000 children, aged five to 17, and that just one dentist, Lloyd Richards, who was the uh, supervising dentist at that time and later became uh, the uh, head of the California um, Oral Health or Dental Health Unit. Even five-year-old children may get a permanent molar, and although there weren't that many of them, but for those five-year-old children, almost half of them had decay in the tooth almost as it erupted. 
uh, although decay doesn't occur before the tooth erupts. Certainly when it's exposed to the oral environment, uh, it can become decayed. Again, uh, going up to 84% of eight-year-olds had permanent tooth decay. 80% uh, or 81% prevalence of permanent decay for all children. And there was a interestingly higher prevalence in higher and middle income areas. And we can speculate why that might be. They didn't do a diet assessment, but perhaps uh, the higher and middle income areas, those children had greater access to sweets and candies uh, that weren't available to costly perhaps for the low-income families. Um, remembering in 1951, there was no fluoride toothpaste and uh, fluoridation of water supplies had just begun nationally after the community trials that started in 1945. Oakland did not get uh, uh, fluoridated till the 1970s. So looking at the ages of the children from 11 to 17, large numbers of, of pupils were examined. In terms of the numbers of decayed, missing, or filled permanent teeth per child, you can see by 11, four teeth had already succumbed to tooth decay, either uh, untreated or treated. And by 15, it plateaued out at about 10 or 11 teeth per child. In terms of the percent of pupils with missing due to caries permanent teeth, you can see that goes from about 18% at age 11 up to 45% by age 17. So it was very common for children to have a permanent tooth extracted because of tooth decay at that time. Chronologically, moving forward, I uh, found a document that uh, was written by the Assistant Attorney General for the state of California on fluoridation of domestic water supplies. And uh, this is a 22 page document, so it's uh, well worth reading. And uh, I just um, put here some of a uh, concluding uh, statement that the California State Board of Public Health in 1950, issued a statement to the effect that it approved the addition of fluoride to public water supplies. So we've had that public policy for quite some time. The 19, sorry, the 1955 document, Dental Carriers Survey, who, why or how, used to be available at the UCSF library. And, uh, now it's not, uh, it's missing from that library. So through interlibrary loan, I was able to get a copy from UCLA's library. And it's, uh, it's a comprehensive document that uh, talks about why do a dental survey, planning for it, publicity for it, all the way to selecting a sample, suggested letters to parents, how you use the IBM equipment in 1955 to analyze the data, et cetera. So uh, even before personal computers were available, there was um, IBM equipment. Lloyd Richards, who I mentioned earlier, uh, published in 1957, a survey of dental caries in school children in parts of Los Angeles City and produced this uh, graph looking at DMF up from zero to 10 teeth um, and for the ages nine through 14 looking at permanent teeth. And for different zones in uh, Los Angeles, there was different levels of naturally occurring fluoride. And then for California as a whole, uh, you see there's a higher level of tooth decay uh, with the sort of comparison community from Aurora, Illinois, where the fluoride in the drinking water was known to be about 1.2 parts per million. Notice that carry severity increases, particularly from age 12 to 14. As I mentioned again, 
Uh, the eruption of the second permanent molar occurs at this time, and so you get a continued increase in tooth decay. Chronologically, moving forward, Lloyd Richards uh, delivered an address to the American Association for the Advancement of Science symposium that occurred in Berkeley uh, at that time in 1965. And I just think it's worth uh, sharing what he said about uh, these, uh, about the state of oral health in California at that time. And he said, dental caries is to a great extent preventable. At least a third of dental caries can be prevented simply by drinking water that contains the proper amount of fluoride, especially during the period that the permanent dentition is forming. And I might add permanent dentition, not only forming, but also coming into the mouth. Any community can adjust the fluoride content of its water supplies to the proper level, which at that time was one part per million. Controlled fluoridation of community water supplies has been scientifically proved beyond any reasonable doubt to be a safe, practical, economical, and effective method for the prevention of dental caries. He goes on to say that fluoridation makes children healthier, saves parents many dollars, saves the community and state millions of dollars in dental care for indigents and institutionalized and because of the resulting shorter time required for dental treatment makes it possible for more people to obtain new dental care everyone benefits yet when parents and others in a community are asked whether or not they want fluoridation then they more often than not decide against it so tooth decay continues to occur at a high rate. Parents continue to put off obtaining needed dental care for their children and themselves. Treatment needs increase in severity and complexity and the cost of dental care increases commensurately. I may add that, as I'll show you later, uh, I'm transmitting uh, this morning from Santa Maria, a community in Southern California that uh, um, decided to fluoridate let me go back. Decided to fluoridate in 2002, and uh, the city council made that decision, and then it was supported by a referendum. And uh, then just six months ago, um, the uh, through budget considerations, uh, fluoridation was stopped without discussion uh, of the implications. And uh, so tonight I'm here down in Santa Maria with Marjorie Stocks and we're going to present a testimony before the city council to try to get that reinstated. Lloyd Richards again, um, published in 67 something from uh, a similar survey that he conducted. Here we look at, he looked at non-fluoride enamel hypoplasia in various uh, varying chloride temperature zones. At that time, uh, the, uh, there was a policy based on evidence that uh, if you lived in a colder climate, then you should have a higher level of fluoride in the water because you're not drinking as much compared to a hotter climate. And so I just wanted to share with you the communities that he uh, um, that he uh, went to with um, his team to investigate this. They examined over 7,000 children and 38% of them had some form of non-fluoride hypoplasia. The reason I bring this up is there was some confusion recently as I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago about uh, uh, dental fluorosis and the uh, differences in measurement of dental fluorosis. There are a lot of other conditions that, uh, that uh, show uh, teeth to have some form of changes in the appearance. And this study is important because it shows the prevalence of those changes uh, in non-fluoride uh, situations. Remember at this stage, uh, um, Yes, fluoride toothpaste had come into being. Uh, maybe some children were swallowing it, but it wasn't considered to be due to uh, fluoride in the water or, or fluoride. And 94% of the enamel opacities uh, were um, 
the opacities were in the, in the enamel. The maxillary teeth were affected um, three times as often as mandibular teeth. This could be due to mouth breathing and exposing all of those upper uh, incisors. And that the maxillary incisors were the teeth most frequently affected. No definite relationship emerges, he and his team said, uh, between the occurrence of non fluoride enamel hyperplasia and the fluoride levels of community water. And then uh, part of the same study um, looking at what should be the optimum level of fluoride uh, in community water supplies in relationship to temperature. We found that there was insufficient numbers of uh, communities in California to do the study. So he went to other states as well. And this is a list of the states uh, and the individual communities. So on the top row here, you've got the fluoride concentration, uh, 0 0.15 parts per million or less, and 1.8 parts per million or more, and several uh, um, uh, ranges in between. And then the maximum temperature, mean temperature of over a um, five year period uh, for that uh, community, where it may be 65 degrees or lower, such as in Berkeley, California, where I live, uh, or as higher than 80 degrees uh, fluoride as would be in uh, Del Rio in Texas, and certain communities in California. Uh, and you see the other states. Colorado, and uh, in particular, Arizona, Texas, and so forth. So uh, they did a complete assessment of many communities to uh, validate the, uh, the idea that fluoride should be a different concentration, perhaps, to achieve the same level of benefit, and that the um, different concentration according to temperature zone. So I'll move now to uh, fluoride surveys and stories. Uh, if you have questions, please go to the uh, chat line uh, and uh, let me just see if there's any questions at this point. I don't see any right now. So as you're thinking of questions, please jot them down and we can go back to them at the end. Appreciate that. So, um, Steve Silverstein, Jared Fine, and I uh, were involved with the evaluation of the children's, uh, California Children's Dental Disease Prevention Program known as the CCDDPP program, or C2D2P2. Um, this was enacted by legislation in 1978-79, and as part of the legislation, uh, an evaluation was required and uh, Steve Silverstein was the primary investigator. You should know that at that time, in the 80s, uh, there was a third of a million children in K through six grades participating in 37, or about more than half of the counties in California at that time. And we went to two communities in 1981, 82, to assess the level of uh, uh, decay in those children and also look at uh, gingivitis. And we followed it up two years later. And I should say that two years is a small amount of time, a short period of time, to assess uh, the progress of clinically detectable tooth decay. Uh, we would have liked more time, but the legislature required the report by 1985. We used historical controls rather than concurrent controls. That is, we looked at kindergarten in 81 and we looked at kindergarten in 83 and compared them. Uh, we didn't look at the, uh, the same children in, who were in kindergarten in 81 and then two years later in, let's say, uh, second grade. Um, just because of age differences uh, in, in the teeth. And uh, so I see a question online. Hi, Dr. Pollock, would you please tell Kathy to turn off her video? It is a flashing light and very distracting. Thank you. So let me see if I can turn off uh, a video here. Uh, 
the video there I'm going to turn on. Sorry. I'm trying. I'm trying. Thanks, Dr. Pollock. I tried to do it myself, but I'm not able to. During okay. Time. All right. Okay. It might be a right click over the name of Kathy or in the lower left. Um, where yeah, it looks I'm, like I'm a managing camera. it. I'm managing it. Let me put more. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm just going one by one to stop the uh, video. So if people would stop their video, that would be great. It's going to take me too long to do that. Okay, thanks. Um, we chose two sites, uh, Boston and Victorville in uh, San Bernardino County in the high desert of Southern California. Um, they have uh, fluoride levels naturally occurring in their water the optimum range and um, the low fluoride site, the low fluoride in the water site was uh, Monterey and uh, areas around Monterey in that school district. And for details of the actual legislation, you can click on uh, the, uh, the link there. I'm just stopping video. Sorry for the delay. Okay, I think that probably takes care of that. So this report uh, was put out by our uh, UCSF School of Dentistry in what was then the Department of Dental Public Health and Hygiene. And the key findings, sorry, the key findings were that the majority of children in this study uh, population in grades K through six had no decay, whether they were in the high fluoride area or the, the uh, optimum fluoride area or the low fluoride area. But some children had substantial amounts of decay and considerable need for treatment. In fact, 25% of children had 80% of the decay. This has been reported in other studies. So no longer was tooth decay the ubiquitous disease that everybody suffered. It was now much more concentrated in a small group of children. Approximately 90% of decay occurred in the surfaces of permanent teeth that have sealable pits and fissures. And at this time, uh, you know, the, the Dentical program and, and uh, other um, policy certainly uh, had been recommending uh, dental sealants, but adoption of dental sealants by the dental community was slow. Uh, these children who experienced dental decay in their primary teeth were likely to experience 50% of the decay by the time they were in kindergarten. So if you're starting a program in kindergarten to reduce tooth decay, it's not going to affect those children already affected by tooth decay. Um, and so uh, we have to start much earlier than kindergarten. Uh, Non-white children, we um, assessed with visually um, the uh, ethnicity or race of, of the children, which I have problems with right now, but uh, that's what we did then. Uh, had substantially more decay and treatment needs than white children. Uh, children in the fluoridated site have less, less dental decay than children in the non-fluoridated site. Uh, significant reductions in gingivitis occurred in all grade levels, and the cost of restoring the children's teeth declined as a result of participating in this uh, dental disease prevention program. Picture of Bob Eisenman there, who uh, persuaded me to become the oral epidemiologist and the uh, principal investigator for the California Oral Health Needs Assessment of Children uh, that 
he managed to uh, persuade uh, the Department of Public Health to support. And, um, and we had an extensive advisory committee. Uh, and you can see the members of the advisory committee in uh, the document uh, that uh, was available on the website. In particular, there was a physician from Davis, Robert Bates, as part of that advisory committee, who said, if we don't get something about fluoridation out of this needs assessment, we're wasting our time. So that was, he was very influential in persuading uh, us to uh, incorporate fluoridation status as part of this needs assessment so that we weren't just finding out who needs this uh, treatment, uh, how many people need treatment, how many children need treatment, but also was there a difference in treatment needs as a result of fluoridation status where they lived? And so we were able to get questionnaire data ahead of the dental screening that the examiners were not privy to that wouldn't bias them to that would determine uh, their uh, residents uh, and uh, whether or not they were lifetime residents in that community. That's important when you're doing that kind of assessment. So um, I'm getting a message that my internet connection is unstable. If somebody uh, tells me they can't hear me anymore or see this, please let me know. So this was a letter from Jared Fine, who was chairman of the Dental Health Foundation at that time, back in 1994, creating the California Fluoridation Task Force that was created as part of the um, what created the Dental Health Foundation, which was money from a newspaper man down in Southern California who uh, felt like we ought to be doing something about fluoridation in California because we ranked really low on the list of states that had fluoridated water. And so he uh, donated, I think it was $50,000 at that time to create the Dental Health Foundation to focus on fluoridation. Tim Collins was the chair. Uh, at that time, he was the dental director for uh, Los Angeles. And Marjorie Stocks uh, was the person who really put uh, everything into place in terms of uh, logistics for the task force and uh, continues to work on fluoridation through our UCSF uh, technical assistance uh, program. We put out newsletters called California Fluoridation Now. And we were very active over a period of time, and very influential in getting uh, financing from uh, foundations to uh, um, initiate fluoridation in many communities in California. The report of the California Oral Health News Assessment uh, was sent as a draft to the Maternal and Child Health Branch, which had initiated the survey, and that was done in 1994. And as a result of that, the MCH branch uh, put out a document called Beyond Russian Embraces in 1995, and you see the cover page of that. It wasn't heavy on statistics from the survey, but it was basically a uh, promotional piece on, on oral health. We presented uh, findings uh, at the American Public Health Association meetings in 95 and 97. And also the California Dental Association, you see pictures of what we looked back then, Jared Fine, Bob Eisman and myself, uh, and uh, um, conveyed our, our, our findings, uh, our highlights, policy implications to the California Dental Association leaders. And then in 1995, going back, uh, that was yeah, 95, uh, this is a photograph of Jackie Speer, who was then uh, in the California State Assembly. She was now in Congress and, and a very prominent member of Congress. She authored the bill in 1995 uh, called AB 733, uh, which was passed and signed by Governor Wilson in spite of opposition by anti Uh Jackie said that uh, uh, those anti fluoridationists burned out two fax machines in her office. And the legislation mandated the fluoridation system um, 
fluoridation of water systems uh, with 10,000 service connections, which is a connection to your house or apartment, um, or more when funding is available. And just as a uh, reminder, this is a picture of John Yana Yanis, who at that time was the national anti-fluoridation leader. Um, he since passed away uh, in 2002 or so. So how did the California fluoridation law come about? Well, there were statewide data. They played a part, but the reports came out later. The first report came out in 1997, beyond the uh, one that MCH put out. And then the full reports, even though the draft had been submitted essentially with the same data, the same findings, uh, that had previously been sent to MCH, but not made publicly available in 1994, this was put out five years later. So, a neglected epidemic, uh, that was a, a, coin, a term coined by Myron Olukian, I believe, in, in Boston uh, about Kerry's at that time. And this is a title that we gave to uh, this find uh, this uh, selected findings and recommendation. And then the full report was published by the Dental Health Foundation. Um, as well as myself, Bob Eisman is named there, Jared Fine, Joanne Wellman, who's now Joanne Well Benson, who was the uh, primary logistics person. Uh, Patricia Kipnis, uh, friend and colleague, is a, a statistician. Jim Allison uh, was in charge of all the data and uh, data cleaning and data management. So it was a great team and uh, we put this document together. So I wanted to share with you the training manual that we had for the epidemiological survey for examiners and recorders. And we have that available to you on our uh, UCSF DPH website. Um, and it goes into the methods. And uh, yeah, again, that's the website. Uh, and you can view the training manual. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of it. It's an extensive document. And then uh, further details of the survey methodology are uh, in the uh, more comprehensive uh, uh, document. As part of the training, we used two uh, published documents. One was by the World Health Organization. At that time, it was the third edition of oral health surveys, that's the methods, now, now in its fifth edition. Uh, and I wanted to share with you the photographs that were available to us from that document, all the examiners had a copy of these uh, uh, of this document. So when we did fluorosis uh, measurements, for instance, they had these photographs as a guide, as well as the written uh, documentation of when to call something normal, questionable, very mild, mild, moderate, or severe. And these photographs were uh, courtesy of Dr. Evans from Hong Kong. And so you see on the top left, normal and then uh, questionable, and then going to uh, uh, what would be, I guess, C here, is uh, very mild, where only a portion, a small portion of the tooth is affected. You can disregard the very white uh, reflection of the light that was used. That's not part of the tooth. That's another consideration we have to take in, into account when we're looking at dental fluorosis. Um, especially in photographs, uh, sorry. And then uh, when slightly more of the tooth is affected, this uh, uh, item D is uh, mild. And then when more than about half of the tooth is affected, it's moderate. And then when you get the staining and, and brown staining and, and sometimes pitting of the tooth, then we call that severe. Alongside that, in the same uh, publication, uh, there was uh, uh, what looks at fluorosis in terms of normal appearance of molar teeth. But here on the second item is what's considered to be a very mild fluorosis, this white snow capping of the cusps is considered dental fluorosis. Okay, obviously not. Too many people are concerned about that. Uh, going back here is uh, evidence of decay in, the, in this primary molar here. And then uh, further white capping of the uh, molars uh, on uh, this photograph 
to the flexion of the upper teeth. And then uh, D is um, tetracycline staining, a darkening of the whole tooth uh, that's due to taking uh, uh, tetracycline either uh, just as an infant or uh, sometimes in utero. Uh, and they're much more darker tetracycline staining here. So this is obviously not phenylphorosis, sorry. And then um, this hyperplasia here, you can see it's a definite line. Uh, and this is due to uh, developmental interruption at a certain period of time that could be due to a high fever. It could be due to um, a number of different systemic conditions that interferes with the normal development of teeth. And again, that's not uh, dental fluorosis. Um, we also used uh, the NIDR publication at the time. Uh, remember, NIDR is now the National Institute of Dental and Cranial Facial Research. 1991, they had this document, and uh, this is available online. You can look it up. And as part of this document, there were more photographs. Uh, we used the Explorer and the Mouth Mirror. This is the setup with a, a portable dental chair. Uh, a dental light uh, with a stand, and then the examiner uh, looking at the uh, teeth of the individual who's lying down, and then recorder sitting by her uh, or him. We had long hair in those days. Um, the males, the men did. Um, and then uh, examples of tooth decay and uh, obvious cavitation as well as not obvious tooth decay uh, with small pits here of tooth decay or on the lingual pit of the upper incisors. That's a common site for pit and fissure decay that uh, often isn't talked about. And then uh, caries that starts in the enamel and produces this brown or cavitation area in these lower uh, teeth here, these lower incisors, uh, or on the mesial surface of a lower incisor here. Then uh, other photographs of uh, what dental students call bummed out teeth, where the whole crown has been destroyed by the tooth. Uh, this could have been a restoration that's lost. Um, here you've got a restoration, part of an amalgam, but also a lot of decay around it. Um, you might question whether or not the decay was removed entirely at the time this uh, tooth was filled. Um, and then this photograph is interesting. Uh, you may not see this so much on surveys of young children, but we have tooth colored fillings and there's uh, an obvious distal uh, tooth colored filling in this tooth here, and then a distal filling in this tooth here. And that could easily be overlooked in the survey. Obviously, these teeth are highly magnified. We don't see teeth as big as that. Um, here, you've got a tooth on this lower uh, incisor where the incisal edge has been restored by a composite restoration. And uh, you may say, well, that's, that's pretty good could be looked better, uh, but it could be missed easily. And then this dark area on the mesial surface uh, here indicating decay, uh, shining through the translucent enamel uh, with some further decay on the adjacent tooth, maybe surrounding an existing restoration. So I just wanted you to be aware that when we do surveys, we're looking at photographs as well as descriptions. So for the 93-94 survey, we looked at Head Start children, non-Head Start children. Uh, that had not been done previously in, in surveys around the country, but we thought it was important. Uh, we looked at elementary schools. This is a traditional age group that's uh, seen, uh, K through three. We also looked at high schools because I was aware of the tremendous need that high school students have for dental care both regular high schools and continuation high schools, which are the schools that 
uh, students go to if they were a high school dropout, for instance, and then they go back and uh, to get um, a general certificate of education. So you've seen this photograph before. Our findings were for preschools that um, of all of this preschool children, 31% had some evidence of treated decay or untreated decay. So that's the prevalence. Uh, the, uh, that is, they had one or more decayed, missing, or filled teeth. Uh, but the converse of that is 69% had no evidence of having tooth decay, which is uh, wonderful to see when we see teeth that look like this. It, it's just wonderful. And they had zero DMA. When we compared uh, the different ethnic groups in different regions and the types of preschools, there was a wide range in terms of tooth decay uh, for groups. And on average, uh, there was 1.3 decay missing and filled primary teeth per preschool child. So on average, everybody's got some decay, but not everybody. Uh, Asian children in the non-fluoridated urban areas and Head Start preschools have the highest percentage. About 80%, 79% of those children in those preschools, four out of five, had untreated or treated tooth decay, with an average of four and a half teeth affected. So we have the prevalence of 79%, and we have the severity of 4.5 teeth affected. Whereas the white children in the fluoridated urban areas in the non Head Start preschools, more affluent preschools, were the group with the lowest percentage, a prevalence of only 10% of untreated or treated tooth decay, where the average was 0.3 of a tooth. So great disparities in terms of tooth decay, who has it? And that allows us then to use that information and perhaps target our efforts. Uh, prevention, but that prevention obviously has to come before preschool. Then we look at grades, grades K through three and looking only at lifetime residents by poverty status, because we had this information filled out by the parent before the examination, in an extensive questionnaire. Below 200%, which is the standard for California in terms of uh, uh, poverty status, and above 200%, so the more affluent families. And what we found in terms of decayed and filled primary teeth, and the standard era of the mean, in the optimal fluoride area, areas, an average of 2.7 teeth affected for these K through three lifetime residents, and the poorer, uh, from poorer families, whereas suboptimal fluoride was one tooth difference. They had one tooth more affected by tooth decay by virtue of the fact they lived in a suboptimal fluoride level. You see the children of the more affluent parents are much better off. They have far fewer teeth affected and uh, the difference, although it's in the right direction, is not statistically significant, whereas the difference for the children from poor families was statistically significant. Looking at two surfaces, you see uh, not only one tooth difference, but you see 2.3 surfaces difference. Again, statistically significant. There's a difference in the more affluent children uh, in the same direction, but not statistically significant. And then this is percent carries free, we're looking at prevalence. And you see that 36% of the poor children in the optimally fluoridated area were carries free compared to uh, fewer children in the suboptimal fluoride area with a greater percentage of more affluent children being caries free. But these were not statistically significant differences. Remembering that you just have to have one small 
cavity or filling to not be caries free compared to looking at uh, severity indices. So I'm a big proponent of using severity and uh, data rather than prevalence data. This slide is a little busy. Uh, what we've got is uh, categories of decayed and filled teeth, whether it's primary or permanent teeth for six to eight year old children. And in California in 93, 94, 73% of six to eight year old children had some evidence of tooth decay compared to the national data that were available at the time of less than that, about 53 or 52%. Whereas the uh, national healthy people objectives uh, was set to uh, be a lower amount. So California doing worse than the country and definitely worse than the objectives set for the nation. Similarly for those children whose parents have less than a high school education, for children who are black or African-American, for Latino, Hispanic children, on every category, it's worse in California, particularly worse for Asian children, but we can't say worse because there were no comparable data for children from Asia. Asia is obviously a huge continent, there's many, many different cultures, uh, but we kind of group them together. Um, <clears throat> this is too busy a slide to go through, so I'm just going to leave it. Uh, it just shows the difference uh, for California, the carious lesions compared to the objective. And then uh, this is untreated caries compared to the national objective. So on every score, every variable, California is worse off than the objective set to the nation. Here we compare for high school students in 10th grade, those that had zero DMFS, they were caries free for the regular high schools, 23.8 or about one in four. Children, uh, students I should say, had no decay, whereas the older children uh, in continuation high schools, had um, far fewer caries free. And then those that had nine plus decayed missing filled surfaces, you see that almost half of the continuation high school students had a lot of decay or filled surfaces. Uh, and, and this compares the severity, whereas the previous slide looked at uh, prevalence, this is severity and you can see uh, six teeth affected on average for the regular high school students in 10th grade compared to more than eight in continuation high schools. Uh, but most of them are filled surfaces, uh, which I'm happy to see. Far uh, fewer uh, are missing than some of the early uh, 1930s, 1950s surveys uh, that we saw for San Francisco and, and Oakland. Um, and, uh, but still a lot of decay untreated. We also found comparing uh, the situation for urgent treatment needs, this is not a caries index, but it is an index that's commonly used in surveys. So we look at children who have no treatment needs, who have some treatment needs, but not urgent, and then those who have urgent treatment needs, where we uh, indicate that those children should go see a dentist as soon as possible. And you can see in the fluoridated red columns here, far fewer of each group have urgent treatment needs compared to the urban non-fluoridated areas. Again, giving much more um, uh, good evidence that fluoridation is effective. I want to move forward now to the 2004-2005 survey. This is the map of California. Um, they selected 204 schools originally and in different regions and the regions are indicated by the color of these dots. And you see there's a, a collection of uh, 
uh, more dots in the high population zones. And, uh, but it's very difficult in surveys to go to the remote areas of California. Uh, it's much more expensive to do that. <coughs> Sorry, is there a question? Okay. Um, I'm going to mute all again. Uh, you can uh, you can unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, and this report is uh, a report called uh, "Mommy, It Hurts to Chew," and it was put out by the Center for Oral Health. Center for Oral Health is the new name for the Dental Health Foundation. Not so new anymore. And uh, they screened uh, some 21,000 or more children, half of whom were in kindergarten and half in third grade, uh, in 186 participating schools. And what they looked for was decayed teeth, full teeth, presence of dental sealants, history of rampant decay, decay experience in seven or more teeth, and treatment urgency. This was based upon the Association of State and Territorial Dental Directors um, uh, recommendations for basic uh, school surveys, basic screening surveys, uh, which has been updated since then uh, a few times. So when you look at the survey tool now, you'll see that it has changed. So this is the mommy and hers to chew document in which they found that half of the children screened were male, which is what you'd expect. 53% uh, were Hispanic. That's the largest uh, ethnic group in California of children now. 27% were non-Hispanic whites, 8% were Asian, 7% were African American. 43% of the children screened were from homes where parents speak a language other than English. We have a, a, a salad bowl in, in California, uh, sometimes called a melting pot, but it's more like uh, a salad bowl in terms of uh, multiple ethnicities and language groups. And uh, um, that's why we have to put out uh, communications uh, in, in multiple languages. And um, more than half of the kindergartners and 70% of the third grade children screened had a history of tooth decay. That's a lot of kids. Uh, and un uh, untreated tooth decay was consistent across grades with more than one out of four children having untreated tooth decay, over 25%. Remember I said earlier in our survey of the school-based dental disease prevention found that 80% of the disease within 25% of the children. So these are some data from that survey and uh, this is kindergarten children. So you have percentage caries free, percentage with caries experience with treated decay, untreated decay, with rampant caries and you see 19% had seven or more teeth affected untreated by tooth decay. Um, and 4.5% in urgent need of dental care. This is for the third grade children, um, where there were slightly more with rampant caries, 22%. 27% had dental sealants. And again, around 4%, 4.2% needing urgent dental care. So obviously we have to provide that urgent dental care but we also have to try to do what we can to prevent the tooth decay in the first place. So this is comparing the two surveys of 2004, 5, and 1993-94. You see the total caries experience came down, and certainly untreated decay came down considerably. It was cut in half, pretty much. And the prevalence of dental sealants went up more than doubled during that period because in the earlier survey, there was no uh, um, provision for dental sealants or for dentists to be paid, reimbursed for dental sealants in the Medicaid program. So did dental sealants make the difference? Not all of the difference probably, but um, there was certainly an increase in the uh, attention to children with uh, untreated decay. 
So this is the third grade, 4.5% reduction in caries experience, almost 50% reduction in included decay, but 140% increase in glycine. Now I want to switch to dental screening laws. These are the states that have dental screening laws. It includes California, but several other. And the uh, one in California uh, requires uh, the children on entry into kindergarten or first grade into public school systems, may include private school systems, I'm not sure, um, be required to have a dental assessment. Um, and uh, there isn't really provision to reimburse those uh, dentists or hygienists or whoever's doing the screening, um, but there is some small uh, money available to the Department of Education to monitor this activity. So this law was enacted in 2006. At that time, it was called AB 1433, and it requires children to receive the assessment of, of the her oral health as part of the school readiness activities for kindergarten entry. Now in 2018, the law seems to have been updated to provide the state dental director with more oversight of the program. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. That includes data collection and the number who are assessed and found to have untreated decay was always part of this. But the new thing for this school-based assessment, uh, the uh, kindergarten, uh, oral health assessment is the number who are assessed and found to have experienced dental disease measured that it's either treated or untreated. So this now gives us a handle on has there been previous treatment. And you can see the legislation at this link. The California Dental Association has uh, a terrific resource whereby you can look up for any county what the data are uh, that have been submitted and reported on uh, kindergarten oral health assessment. And um, the assessment form includes the date of the evaluation, the presence of caries experience as evidence by visible dental caries or dental restoration, the presence of visible untreated dental caries, assignment to a category of treatment urgency, urgent, early dental care, or no obvious problems. And uh, that's a very useful uh, assessment uh, measure of treatment urgency that's very standardized across the country. So I took a look at some of the data that were uh, available, uh, and I wanted particularly to look at a couple of communities uh, that have fluoridation, but are encountering some opposition to fluoridation. So the community of Oroville in Butte County in California is fluoridated, but there seems to be some challenges to it. So I looked at the data, and for Oroville City Elementary in Butte County, uh, 321 children were eligible to be screened, and 282 were actually screened. For untreated decay, 73 of them had untreated decay. Um, there is uh, some waiver that uh, can be applied for by the parents to uh, not have their children screen, not too many of those occur there, or they may not consent, okay? And so um, these are the data for that particular school district in Butte. And this is for all of the children in Butte County. You can see that only about half of them actually were screened. And so I just compared the proportion of the children with untreated decay. This is just prevalent data. What's missing is the treated decay. So we don't know that. Now the percent with untreated decay for Oroville, which is the Florida community, is about 26%, but for Butte County as a whole, including Oroville, is about 30, 31%. So this could be used as evidence to indicate that there is less untreated tooth decay prevalence in the Florida community. But that doesn't take into consideration the percent with treated decay. 
So that's a caveat that we have to be mindful of. I'm down in Santa Maria, as I mentioned, in Santa Barbara County, because tonight, Marjorie Stocks and I are gonna be providing testimony to the city council that stopped fluoridation six months ago after it had been instituted in 2002. So here in the Santa Maria Bonita Elementary School District in Santa Barbara County, there are 1,700 uh, plus students eligible for the screening in the kindergarten or first grade, primarily kindergarten, uh, with about um, less than half of those, almost a third, more than a third of them actually being screened. 102 showed evidence of untreated decay. Compared to Santa Barbara as a whole, and you can see Santa Maria takes up a large portion of Santa Barbara as a whole. Um, and uh, just comparing these two, and again, what's missing is the treated decay. But in terms of the percentage with untreated decay, you can see that uh, for Santa Maria, which is fluoridated, uh, about 15% had untreated decay, whereas for the county as a whole, more than 17%, 18% had tooth decay untreated. So this is some evidence that uh, the fluoridation in Santa Maria may be helping, and probably is. But what I did then was I looked at comparing Santa Maria Bonita Elementary with the Santa Barbara, not including Santa Maria, and then compared the proportions there. And what we find is that yes, 14.9% of the children screened in Santa Maria had untreated decay, but then a higher proportion, obviously, in Santa Barbara County, not including Santa Maria, had tooth decay. So this is some of the evidence that might be presented this evening. This is just a list of all of the elementary schools in the Santa Maria Elementary Schools District. Another community in Santa Barbara County adjacent to the city of Santa Barbara is Montecito, which is a um, more affluent community. But you can see that part, uh, this is the water, uh, Drinking report, sometimes called the Consumer Confidence Report for 2017, that groundwater average is just about optimum for uh, fluoride levels that's recommended across the country, which is 0.7. And uh, whereas it's not added, this is naturally occurring. You can see there are additional uh, water sources that have much lower fluoride levels. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be an average for the water as a whole for Montecito. So there's some evidence that they have close to optimum fluoride level in part of their uh, water source. You'll notice here that the maximum contaminant level for fluoride is two parts per million or milligrams per liter. Uh, above that, it's advised that children under the age of nine not consume uh, drinking water on a regular basis because of the risk of developing deadly fluorosis. The public health goal for fluoride, uh, fluoride in drinking water in California is one part per million. That might have to be revisited since the uh, national standard is now 0.7. So, Montecito, high socioeconomic status, some water is naturally fluoridated. Uh, they have a small number of children that were screened or eligible. Uh, it's a smaller community, but only three children have untreated decay. And when we compare the Montecito with Santa Barbara, not including Montecito, you see that only 5.5% of Montecito had untreated decay compared to 18.3%. This count goes along with a previous slide looking at children from more affluent families having much less uh, tooth decay. Coming to a conclusion now, and then we'll save some time for discussion. 
Um, so please be thinking of questions to write down in the chat line. In 2017, the uh, state uh, California Department of Public Health, Office of Oral Health put out the uh, document, Status of Oral Health in California, Oral Disease Burden and Prevention. And uh, part of this, uh, I'm showing a table here uh, that looks, it's a busy table, but let me just explain what it is. So it looks at Healthy People 2020 objectives for the country, in terms of dental caries experience for young children aged three to five in their primary teeth, the target is 30%, no more than 30% have dental caries experience, both and third. Uh, the baseline was 33% based upon national data. And uh, the California baseline was 20% more, considerably more. For the second uh, group, age six to nine, looking at primary and permanency, you see California has a lot more tooth decay than the US baseline or the target. And for adolescents, we didn't have the data for 13 to 15 year olds put into this uh, baseline data. Although we have 10th grade children who are probably 16 year olds. Untreated tooth decay, young children, again, California data shows slightly higher. So we're taking care of a lot of the treatment of the children, but it's not at the national level or at the objective. And it's very, um, it's, it's exactly the same pretty much as the baseline data uh, for California uh, compared to the nation as a whole. But we still have some ways to go to get down to the 25.9% level and we don't have the data for 13 15 year olds now the document says there's no california and adult caries prevalence or severity but we do have a recent older survey of adults that was done by the council for oral health and so my next slide just shows some of that the document's called the healthy smile never gets older it was uh, issued in March of 2018 by the Center for Oral Health. This is the link to that document so you can see it. And also you should know that Sahiti Paskara, who was a principal investigator for that setting, gave a presentation in this seminar series uh, last year at about this time, uh, almost exactly a year ago. Um, and what they found was, in terms of untreated tooth decay, or large numbers of adult, older adults suffering from untreated tooth decay, half the older adults residing in skilled nursing facilities have untreated tooth decay. More than one in three community dwelling older adults suffer from untreated tooth decay. In other words, it's a big problem for older adults. So, uh, this is my summary slide. And then I will try to answer your questions and we can have a discussion between ourselves. Caries in California has been a public health problem for decades. Community water fluoridation reduced the burden of caries has been studied and promoted for decades. More caries in children from poor families and children from more affluent families. Fluoridation reduces disparities in caries between children from poor families and those from more affluent families. In spite of reduced caries severity with fluoridation, caries continues to be a public health problem for low-income groups and for seniors. Caries severity, this is my pitch, is a more sensitive indicator of the burden of tooth decay than caries prevalence, but I think we need both. It's easier to get caries prevalence data uh, and agreement on that. So uh, for discussion, um, I'd like to have a discussion uh, on should we, or how should we continue carry surveillance? And what strategies should be used to reduce carries? So I'm gonna open it up now, and uh, I would prefer that you use the chat line because that allows us not to be all talking at the same time.
Well, I'm not seeing any um, any questions or people willing to uh, to communicate by the chat line. It's possible some people are on the phone and can't use the chat line, so I decide to unmute you all, although you can all unmute yourself. Are you American Eagle? No, uh, we're getting a lot of background noise. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna unmute you all, and then you can individually unmute yourself. So um, I'm just going to read what Jay Kuma has written. Uh, the, the California Oral Health Plan 2018 to 2028 outlines the targets and strategies and surveillance plan. And so I did not include that. I apologize for not being totally comprehensive. And there are uh, some other surveys that I have not included. Um, but uh, Jay's quite right. Uh, we should be. Uh, using that California health plan to, to look at these, uh, uh, how we plan to deal with carriers in California. So thank you, Jay, for that. So the question uh, from one of our incoming dental public health residents, can we include dental care into primary care? And then another one, where have we had the best success moving to the more recent survey? Uh, so, can we include dental care into primary care? Certainly primary care for very young children uh, has uh, more and more included uh, preventive strategies like uh, fluoride varnish and that's now recommended and it's now paid for uh, so that uh, in the, uh, the poorest families can uh, uh, get their children uh, assessed by the pediatrician or the family care provider uh, and dental um, uh, fluoride varnish can be applied. So I think that is a step forward. We don't know whether or not how successful that strategy is yet, uh, at least here in California. In terms of where we had the best success moving in more recent surveys, um, in terms of uh, success, I think uh, periodically, what should we focus on moving forward? Uh, I think we should focus, obviously, in the uh, as as Jay has pointed out in the in the um, health plan uh, for California. Um, thank goodness we've got some funding now for uh, including uh, more uh, surveillance activities. Uh, I think we need to continue those. Uh, measuring the status of uh, children coming into school system is one way to assess how well strategies that are occurring before children get into school is successful. But it doesn't address the older groups, but I think we have to focus where we can on the youngest children with limited resources. So Jay points out here that tooth decay uh, prevalence, or caries prevalence, which I think is untreated caries prevalence, has declined from 60 to 32%. Uh, and we have seen this across the board, uh, he says in, in kindergarten children in the last 17 years. I think we've seen this across the board in terms of treated caries. Uh, the question is, uh, which groups are um, 
benefiting more than others, which groups are getting left behind um, in terms of ethnic groups, low income groups, etc. So uh, these will always be our concerns, and uh, um, we have to really address uh, early childhood carers uh, and the strategies that we can uh, adopt prior to uh, prior to that. With the use of SDF, silver diamine fluoride, what are the criteria survey surveillance are using to distinguish between arrested and untreated decay? That's from one of our previous residents, Sarah Gazal, who's sitting uh, in uh, British Columbia. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, it's a really good question. Uh, I think we know that it will arrest uh, carries in the majority of cases, in the vast majority of cases. So it doesn't advance to the more complicated kinds of uh, root canal treatments that are needed, the extractions. Uh, it will be easier to see a cavity if it's got silver diamond fluoride because it will be black. Um, and, uh, um, but I haven't seen uh, survey criteria that include uh, the use of SDF and, and how that's going to change the appearance of teeth when it's applied. Like I say, most of those teeth will appear black uh, and make it easy to do uh, surveillance. But it won't distinguish between an active lesion and an inactive lesion or arrested uh, lesion. So, um, that remains to be seen. Question comes in, uh, can we focus more effort on improving payment systems, differentiating between those children who have Medi-Cal versus covered California dental plans? Um, I think payments for Medi-Cal uh, has uh, increase uh, across the board, and uh, particularly with the Dental Transformation Initiative, the counties that are participating in that. Um, that assessment, those uh, evaluations have uh, not been reported on yet. Uh, they're not due for a couple of years yet. So those strategies for um, that have been employed for improving uh, the situation with regard to carries, uh, we look forward to, to seeing those evaluations. In terms of uh, improving payment systems, we know that, as I mentioned, not only dentists, but uh, pediatricians can uh, be reimbursed for, uh, for uh, the application of dry varnish for very young children. So we hope that that is uh, being uh, utilized much more. So I think we're coming towards the end of our time uh, and I uh, appreciate everybody's participation. Uh, I wanna say thank you to everybody to um, uh, paying attention, staying with us uh, during this time period. And uh, hopefully those documents that I provided you will be uh, of some use to you. And uh, um, I look forward to participating perhaps as a participant rather than a speaker at future uh, presentation. So as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> excuse me, as I mentioned earlier, we will not be um, holding this in the summer as usual, but we will be back in the fall. So at this point, I think I'm gonna stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. And, uh, and I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you all so much.